Thank you so much, friends. I am honored to be here, um, to be able to share what God has put on my heart, um, what I think is very, not just important, but crucial to Christianity today. Um, and I would just like to ask everybody to bow their heads. We're going to pray and ask the Lord to bless our time. Jesus, I want to thank you so much for all of these wonderful people here, God. Every young person who made it a point to be here, God. I want to thank you, Jesus, for the fact that your work that you've done in them, Lord, has led them to these decisions, God, and the fact that they're here. I pray, Father, that you would bless every single person here, Lord, not to hear from me, but to hear directly from you, Jesus. I pray, Lord, bless me to speak your truth, Lord, and I pray that you would do your work in every heart. Thank you so much, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, I want to get straight to the message. My name, actually, no, that's the wrong way of doing it. I want to get straight to the message, and then I'm telling you my name. You guys already know my name, but um, I am from House of Bread Church, and I am privileged just to be here. I love you guys' church. My parents go to this church. I grew up in this church, so uh, my heart will always be here in some way. So it's awesome um, for me to be here. Um, I want to get to the word today, and um, I want to start off just saying this, that, you know, you and I, we live, I think I say this probably at the beginning of every message, it's like my main intro, but you and I, we live in a very interesting time. Every human being can say that, because every person that's born, the world is always changing, and whenever they come into the world, it's a unique time. But truly, I believe that the days that you and I are living in are very unique and crucial. To what? To Christianity? Christianity, the church, that's always going to survive. But I think that, not just survive, it's going to be victorious. But I think that the day that you and I live in, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to fall into place. You and I live in the greatest day of freedom. Every person decides what to do. Most people your age, even 50, 60 years ago, wouldn't have zero ability to decide where to go. For example, they wouldn't be able to decide, hey, I want to be in church today or not. It was decided for them. Today, most people at 16 years old can go wherever they please. Sometimes they travel. Sometimes they fly places without their parents. That was unheard of 50 years ago. You and I have a lot of freedom. Now, why is this time unique? If you look at scripture, if you look at the Bible, there's one thing that you see consistently. And it's something that is backed up by the very words of God. That young people have a lot of potential. Potential not just, oh man, you can live out your dreams and potential for yourself. No. Young people have a lot of potential to impact the world, to impact the city, to impact their churches. Almost everything that has been accomplished in the world has been accomplished by young people. Young people have the guts to go out and do things that, you know, other people say, don't do that. That's crazy. That's, that's, that's suicide or whatever. And young people... We'll go over with it. Young people, one of the things that you and I have is that when we fall, when we fail, we're too young and too inexperienced to understand, hold on, maybe I should relax. We go and try it again. And that's a benefit, and sometimes a negative. Uh, but that's something that you and I have, and God created every person that way. And the reality is that you and I today as young people, if young people are many times the engine of where society goes, of what your city looks like, what a country is like, what your church is like, you and I have more freedom than any other generation before us. We have a freedom of choice. Think about this. hundred years ago, if you wanted to know something, there was something that you wanted to study. Honestly, it doesn't matter what you wanted. It's based on where you grew up, what your parents did, and whatever school was right next to you. You had a good teacher, Great, you'd learn something. You don't have a good teacher, you'd probably be illiterate or you'd read basically. The whole point I'm trying to show you is that you have a choice, every choice you make every day. What to read, what to watch, what to listen to, even on the drive here. Most people didn't have that before. And these choices we take for granted, why? Because it's just something that we do every day. What I listen to, what I'm going to subscribe to, how I spend two hours, what I consume. It's just a common thing that you and I do. But it's crazy because those small decisions, they will impact you forever. They add up. All I'm trying to say with this is that you and I have a great responsibility. 
We have a lot of potential and we have a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. Today I want to talk about something. You know, in the church, obviously for a very good reason, the main thing that we always talk about is our spiritual lives. Because that's what it's all about. Jesus gave us new life where? Obviously in our spirit. He made us new and everything. God is, lives in the spiritual world. He's here in the physical world. He's everywhere. But we focus a lot on the spiritual world. And sometimes we forget to think about something that is so commonplace and so important. But somehow gets lost in all of the conversation and all the messages and sermons. Our mind. Our mind. Our brain is one of those things that is just kind of like when it comes to Christianity, we don't really dwell too much on. It's all about, you know, the spiritual world. And sometimes we actually completely ignore our mind. But I want to show you that the mind is one of the most important things that you and I have to think about today. Some people say, well, you know, it's not about the mind. Whatever you have in your spiritual life, that's what's most important. I want to say that they're completely connected. You cannot disconnect them. In fact, I want to just give you a little sampling of this in Scripture. I want to read a couple verses that you and I have heard all of our life when it comes to what happens to us, how we came to God, what we were like before God, what we were like after God, common verses about salvation and, and the state of human beings before and after meeting Christ for real. And I want to read it to you, and I want you to pay attention to a few key words. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. This is in Ephesians chapter 4. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. He's describing, it's being described right here, what a person who rejects God, who lives apart from God, is like. It's describing in a very honest way, the state of their heart and the state of their soul. And it's painting a picture that they are completely separated from the life of God. Common verse. But listen to the words that we just read. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding, and they are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance. Further on it says, that having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so sin, to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. This is a common verse that we study when it talks about people before they meet God. And the thing that you see consistently being mentioned is something that has to do with the mind. The way you think, the way you understand, ignorance. Further on, it says that there's a change. And these, once again, are verses that, that you and I read all the time. And it says that, that, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. To be made new where? In the attitude of your mind. Our mind and our spiritual life are completely connected. You know how you, should, you can identify if you're a person that doesn't believe that? Or a person who's not aware of that? Usually you can identify yourself in which way? You separate your practical life from your spiritual life. You may be a very good worshiper when it comes to services. You may be somebody who cares about reading the Bible. But a lot of times your practical life does not match up what you really care about. And why? Because I think that you kind of separated the idea that your mind and your heart are equally important. Maybe they're even the same. Who knows? Today, more than ever... We have to understand where the battle is happening. You understand that the further we go in our life, the more evident it becomes to you, if you're seeking after God, that we're in the middle of a war. It's a war. 
And I know a lot of times when we hear the Bible use something as an example, that's exactly what we jump to. That's just an example. We somehow say, well, this is what war is, right? The example that's being used, bloodshed, young people dying, your body being messed up. That's war. And then the spiritual war, it's, you know, it's, an ex it's, a, it's something just be, friends, no. The Bible actually turns it completely upside down when it says, don't worry about your physical death, right? Worry about the second death, which is a spiritual death. What the Bible shows us is, in fact, that Christianity is probably the ultimate picture of what war looks like. Why? Because the two sides of this war have been going at it since the first person existed. The devil has hated God since you and I were created. And they've always been against each other. And the battle doesn't stop. The devil doesn't give up. He doesn't get tired. You know, an enemy, they keep going and going and going. You read in history, sometimes there are wars that lasted 300, 400 years in a row without stopping. Young people just being slaughtered and slaughtered, and they would just fight. I mean, can you imagine 300 years? Like more than the existence of the United States. Length of time, just a consistent war. But sooner or later, in this case, very, a lot later, the war ends. Somebody just gets tired. Somebody gives up. Somebody finally just relaxes. Why are we even fighting this war? This was started by like 10 generations before us. The devil doesn't get tired. He doesn't give up. The Bible shows us that he will never give up. And you see it. No matter what generation comes up. No matter who. No matter what the situation is. Even, you know, hundreds of years ago when everybody was Christian, when Christianity was the thing, if you didn't go to ch ch church, even if you didn't believe in God, you had to go to church. It was taboo. People wouldn't go to your business. People wouldn't pay attention to you. They wouldn't let you, you marry their daughter or whatever, vice versa, because you were weird. You don't go to church. Even in times like that where it seemed like Christianity seemed to flourish, what was happening? Millions of people were dying and going to hell back then too. He doesn't give up. It's a real war. And the war is for you and I. It's for our souls. And when we're talking about war, there's a lot to be thinking about. And I want to make it very clear. All of the things that you can talk about in war, what weaponry you have, what condition, physical condition you're in, all of those things are important. But I want to talk today about the mind. Why? Because I think knowing your battlefield is probably one of the most important things. You can have all the armor you want. You can have all the armor you want. You can have the most effective weaponry in a war. If you show up to a wrong battlefield, <laughs> good, good for you. You can have all that, but what happens? I'm not saying it's more important than the other ones, but it's just as important. Where is today's battleground? Where is this war being fought today? In your mind more than anywhere. Think about the people that you knew who grew up with you in the church, people who loved Jesus with you, people who maybe worshiped next to you. How did most of them disappear? It, it somehow, some way, it, it was connected to their mind. Maybe they were in class and they heard one too many things that were thrown against God. Maybe they heard theories that were preached one too many times or, or they had a very respectful professor or, or high school teacher who convinced them that God doesn't exist. Maybe it was a temptation. They just could not stop looking at things and consuming things with their mind. It's just fun. It's just a movie. And they just wanted it. One way or another, most of our battles and most of our failures and most people who fall away from Christ who grew up in the church, somehow it's through their mind. Because the Bible shows that the battle between God and the devil, it changes our spirit and our spirit changes the way we think. What happens when you are saved? We just read about the description of someone who is messed up, someone who is separated from God, and everything had to do with the way they think and the fact that they were ignorant and their hearts were hardened and the attitudes of their minds were messed up. What happens when a person like that comes to Christ? God changes the attitude of their mind. It's a process. We can't break it down step by step. But one thing that we're sure of is that if you truly meet God, something happens. How is it? Think about the time when you met God. If you haven't met God, then think about this just in general. Maybe you will meet him today. 
Think about that moment when you truly came face to face with Christ. Like for real, like when you were baptized in the Spirit, when you first gave your life to God. Was it just a spiritual experience that you walked away from and forgot about 30 minutes later? Or was it something that when it happened, I mean, everything changed. One moment you were sitting next to people and you're just there. They're just other people. You don't really. Next moment, you just love every person you see. Anybody who's been baptized in the Spirit knows what I'm talking about. The moment you're baptized, one of the first things you feel is an intense love for God. And then an intense love for the people around you. You're hugging everybody. You know how it is at camp. Everybody's hugging each other. Everybody's like, it's like, man, we're like one big happy family. How does that happen? Something changed in your spirit and it affected the way you even think, the way you view other people. The attitude of your heart changed. And it had a full effect on your whole life. I remember when I had that, the first thing I did was when I came home, I was like, man, I really all of a sudden cared about my relationship with my parents. Before, I was just, I don't, I mean, I love my parents. My parents are great. But, I mean, I was just living just for myself. And if my mom wanted me to do something, if there was a way out, I'd find it, all right, because I didn't want to do it. I had five younger siblings. I'll make sure to maybe, you know, delegate responsibilities. I remember one of the first things that happened was the way I viewed my parents, the way I viewed my relationship with them. It was instant. I, I, I cared about it. I failed a lot, but it, I just could not stop thinking about it. The way we think determines the way we act. The attitude of our heart, the way we think. And there are two ways. People who are darkened, which we just read, they're separated from God. They're separated from the Spirit of God. Who's the only one who represents truth in the universe? In period. Obviously God, He is the truth. The moment you're separated from Him, you're, you're in ignorance. You're lost. You can be so sure about things. You can be so sure about your life, about what's important, what's not. But you have zero clue of, to the truth. Is it true what you believe? Is it not? Is what you think is important? Is that truly important? Is it useless? It, maybe, it's, well, maybe it's a sinister lie, not even just not the truth. When God meets us and he regenerates us, I don't know if that's the right word. It doesn't matter what word you use. When he gives us new life it changes our spirit see a person has what a person is made up of spirit right of a soul and flesh a body and salvation is a unique thing it's a very hard thing to describe how does salvation work one thing that i think most people agree with is that when salvation happens it happens in our spirit first now i'll kind of explain this god when you talk about yourself as a person, you have control over your body, right? What you eat, what you don't eat. If you exercise, you don't exercise. <laughs> How much you sleep or don't sleep. You have control over that. You can affect it. Your, your soul, your mind, the way, all that. In some ways, you can access it. Maybe change it. Maybe, you know, you go to a bunch of positive speakers and, you know, you sit with the headphones and you listen. You are great. You're amazing. And then you somehow like, you know, kind of become more positive as a person or vice versa. You work at a job where you deal with a lot of messed up people and guess what? You become cynical in your thinking. In some ways, there's still access to it. The one thing that you have zero control over is your spirit. We can't even really describe what the spirit of a person is, to be honest. What is the spirit of a person? I don't know. It's something deeper than my soul. Something like that. It's interesting, though, when you look in Scripture, there are multiple examples, especially in the Old Testament, that God speaks to us in the Spirit. There's something unique that the Spirit, a lot of times, is the channel in which God uses to communicate with us. God says, you know, what kind of worshipers is He like? Somebody? Spirit and truth? The spirit is very important. When we meet Christ, our spirit is born again. It affects. Our spirit is changed. Our spirit is open to God. If before it was closed, when we meet God, it opens up. 
And in fact, when the Holy Spirit moves into our heart, He lives in the Spirit. He doesn't live in my soul or, you know, He lives in my spirit. It's contained in my body. And the thing is, it changes, starts changing the way you live, the way you think and all that, as I've made clear probably 10 times over now. Your instincts, I'll give you once again an example. If before your instincts were dead to love other people, to notice other people's needs, right? Before, I mean, I mean, most people were just kind of, unless it's beneficial to us, where we can get something in return, we don't really care too much about other people's needs. If it's convenient, like it will only take 10 minutes, I'm cool. But I mean, if I got to pull over in rush hour traffic and 110 degree weather, I, you know, somebody else got it. <laughs> they got AAA probably. You know what I mean? You were dead to that. But what happened when your spirit was regenerated, even the way you think changed. You started noticing that stuff. The battle that is happening today is in your mind. Why? Because when you look at scripture, the battle is described in a simple way. In you. In you as a person. There's the spirit and then there's the flesh. And both of them are yanking at what? Your soul. You. Both of them. When you're saved, that's when that battle begins. When you're saved, that's when the battle begins. Some people think, well, hold on. That battle, well, that whole thing, isn't that before? No, the people who aren't saved, they don't really have a battle. They're just dead. Yes, the flesh rules over them. There's no even spirit to fight back. But when you become a follower of Christ, a son of Christ, or a son of God, or a daughter of God, your spirit is born again, and all of a sudden, the God's spirit in you starts fighting with your flesh over you. That's what we deal with when we talk about temptation and all those things. And many times, this battle happens in your mind. I see it in two ways. The flesh changes the way we think as well. I'll give you an example. When you open yourself up and give your flesh more power, in which way? Your flesh, I mean, that's a general word, but we know that when it comes to temptation, when it comes to things that corrupt us, it's usually somewhere through our flesh, right? We see it with our eyes. Or... And when we have this battle, the flesh, it really affects you. And the more you consume things that you know are against God, you're watching something that you know it's against God, but you continue consuming it slowly, but surely, you just kind of start growing colder to God. That word sensitivity, when your spirit is powerful, when you fasted for a few days, when you focused on God and you didn't care about anything else, when there were those times where you were in a worship place where for 45 minutes you just spent time in the presence of God, or when you've just been sitting, driving in your car in traffic and thinking about God, thinking about eternity, heaven, your calling, dwelling on just God's heart, what He's like, the more you do that, what happens? I mean, you're less likely to want to even deal with the flesh. Your soul, it just yearns for God and you get closer and you become more sensitive to God. That's what happens. All of this is happening in your mind. You know, one of the things that really inspired me to search the scriptures and really try to understand, God, how does our mind work? How does this all connect it? And I'm not an expert in any way. I just wanted to see for myself one of the biggest things that led me to that is because of people that I meet, just like you, your age. They, they're, they're, I mean, maybe you know people like that. Maybe you're one of those people. They're consistently going really high, and they're always falling low. High, low, high, low. And they're just being tossed around. They go to class. They come back and they're just like, okay, I can't even worship God. I don't even know. I have so many questions. Is it even normal? Is this a... Then they come from camp and they're just amazing. And they're like the best people that you want to be around. And just this constant like up and down. People who are just being torn apart by doubt. Torn apart by thoughts. And I was like, God, does it really have to be that way? And the older you get, the more you meet people like that. They're just not in control of their own brain, not in control of their own life. And it affects their spiritual life no matter how much they think they love God, and they do. The battlefield is in the mind, and today I just want to go over a couple things 
that you and I need to understand if we want to win the battle of our mind. First and foremost, you have to understand that God has already given us victory. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. God has given us victory. He said that no one can take us away. Nobody can literally drag us back. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight, we know all this, right? They're not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Does that sound like somebody who is not in control of their own mind, of their thoughts? Does that sound like somebody who, in the moment they read in the news that they found a new, I don't know, we were talking about this so much recently. If you watch and it's like, oh, they found a new tablet that was written from the days of Jesus, and it says that he was married to some woman, and he had like five kids. And you watch it and it's like, man, these names, the names of the archaeologists is like top dogs. And, you know, Harvard professors sign up right behind. They're like, this, I mean, we're pretty sure this is authentic. We did some preliminary tests and it's carbon dating and all that. It sounds authentic. And you're reading this and you're like, hold on, really? I mean, I know that I, it's probably a lie, but what if it's not? And you start getting dragged into that. When you read this, that's not the picture you get. You get something completely different. You see a picture of a person who's not just a warrior that's just trying to barely survive. You see a picture of someone who is a conqueror. Not just a survivor, a conqueror. I understand there's times in our life where we have to survive. Believe me, that's life. God actually, think about every Bible hero. There are moments where they had to just survive. God usually put them in that place to learn to hear his voice. But every other time after that, they're not just surviving, they're victorious. That's right, it says here that we demolish. I mean, this is giving you a strength. It says we demolish arguments. We take every thought captive and we make it obedient to God. You don't have to be controlled by your thoughts. You know, flesh is one of the ways through our flesh that we slowly give up the rights and we slowly fall away. The other thing is we got to understand that the devil does send us thoughts. He sends us thoughts. And the more you're closer to God, the sneakier those thoughts are. Remember that warning that we see in the New Testament about an angel of light that appears to you? What's the point of that verse? It's warning us that something that may even seem not dangerous or on the contrary, even amazing, a message, a thought. An angel, it's not the point that the angel appeared to you. It's that when an angel appears, he usually gives you something. Think about the Bible. Whenever an angel would appear, he wouldn't just appear like, here I am. Yes, I'm real. See ya. You know what I mean? It wasn't like that. Whenever an angel would appear, he would always give a message or a direction or something that, that was there, right? You see that in, all throughout Scripture. And then God warns us that sometimes an angel of light can appear and you won't even realize it, but it's not who you think it is. His message is not light. His message is not from God. There are so many thoughts that you and I accept every single day that are slowly destroying us. They're like a little poison that you don't really feel right away. A lot of girls, for you, it's much easier to spot this. Why? It's not like it's just about, oh, God's not real. But usually, if somebody's strong, you don't come at them as, oh, God's not real. They know that that's, you know, that's not true. But you come to them even like this. Hey, I'll be honest. Did you see her? She looks a lot better than you. Hey, do you see the acne on your face? Hey, do you see the friends that he has? And your friends and who you hang out with. Hey, do you see what kind of car he drives? I'm just using the simplest, most, I mean, I'm sorry, it's like a teen movie. I know. <laughs> but simplest stuff, because all of us went through it. Whether you're older or you're in teen Bible school, you're going through it right now. Where do you think those thoughts come from? Where? And what are they trying to get to? You understand, it's not just so that you would feel kind of bad. It's so that you would literally... Look at yourself and devalue yourself. 
Think about it. You were created by God. If you are a son or daughter of God, meaning you gave your life to Christ, your measure, your worth is, I mean, it's amazing. Jesus proved it. He paid for it and he paid with his own life. I mean, think about the price. What does that say about you? I'm not saying you're worthy of it. Nobody's worthy of it. But nonetheless, the fact remains that God paid that price. You're a child of God. You belong to him. You're a representative of his kingdom. You know what kind of future you have? It's an eternity spent with him. It's an eternity where you will be, I mean, the high priest, that's what the scripture says. You can keep going and going. Imagine who you are in Christ. And when you allow those kinds of thoughts to simply enter into your mind, what ends up happening? Slowly but surely, your view of yourself is degraded. Sooner or later, you don't even realize that it's not just about looks anymore. It's how you feel about yourself. And the moment comes where God wants to take you further in your walk with him. And he says, hey, I want to give you a task now. And he starts saying, hey, I want you to do this. I want you to sing in worship. I want you to get out there. Yeah, I know maybe nobody even knew that you could sing. I want you to contact the worship team and talk to them. Maybe try out. And you're like, me? Me? Nah. No way. Look at, look at all these other people. She can sing. He can sing. And you don't even realize that you're literally right now losing out an opportunity from God that will advance your spiritual life and your place in God's kingdom where how God wants to lead you. You're calling. And it started with a simple thought way back when you were just like, oh, man. And started comparing yourself to people and started accepting these thoughts. I'm just giving you one example, and there's so many of them. How do people get there? Thoughts. Thoughts. Who sends them? It's clear. The one who hates God and he hates you and he won't give up. So my first word of advice from scripture, it's not mine. I want to read this really, really long thing to you, but I want you to hear it because it's literally in the last sentence that the point is at. In 1 Corinthians, he says in, in, in chapter, or in 1 Corinthians, he says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. It's showing us this picture, and it's saying, I want you guys to remember our ancestors. Remember the people of Israel who walked out of Egypt. And they were walking literally with God's presence in a physical form. Literally. I mean, can you imagine waking up every day and you see this cloud and it's like supernatural. It doesn't go away and it's leading you. And at night, it's like this pillar of fire. And you just walk out and you're like, whoa, I wasn't dreaming. This is real. Like God's with us. Wait, we're in the desert. Uh, where do we get food? Where do we get water? Oh, it's cool. It'll just appear in the morning. Just wake up. Like, open your tent flap. And it's like right there. And you don't even have to worry about saving it because it's cool. Tomorrow you'll have just as much. Oh, where do you get water in the desert? From a rock. Like, who logically, I mean, if anybody watched Bear Grylls or anything, you don't go to a rock to get water, right? No, you just get it from a rock because, you know, God's with you. And there's this picture, and he's reminding us, that, think about it, Israel, they were with God, they saw him. But listen to what he says next. He says, nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. He switches gears right away, and he says, you know what? All that sounded good, but did you know how most of them ended up? They were just scattered throughout the wilderness by the end. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. I don't know how to explain this part right here. But all I know is that what God is trying to say to us is extremely important because listen to what it just said. These things happened to them. Everything I just read, them experiencing that, them dying in the desert because God was not pleased with them. All of this happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. Does that sound like God is about to say something very important? All of this was recorded so that you and I can learn something from it. And what is it? 
Verse 12, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. What? If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. You know what the lesson in all of that was? I don't care where you are in your relationship with God. You're a baby Christian. You're a preacher. You're a pastor. I don't care. You're a bishop, a prophet. I don't care who you are and where you are with God in your relationship, how high you are. The one thing that should never change is how on guard you are. How on guard you are. Because the devil never gives up. Never. And what happened to these people who experienced such amazing presence of God? They still somehow lost. Not the nation of Israel, the people themselves, the individuals. My first thing for you is you have to be on guard at all times. If we're talking about fighting a battle, the worst thing you can do is sleep through it. The worst thing to do is if you don't have somebody watching at night just in case. This does not mean that you live in fear. Don't miss those two things up because this is really important. It doesn't mean that you're constantly going, okay, what if I fall today? Oh, uh, what if, okay, I can't do that. Oh, I got to not hang out with this person. I can't do, and you're just like constantly like afraid. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking to people who are conquerors, but it's reminding them, don't get cocky. Don't become prideful. Be connected to God at all times. Don't live with yesterday's victories. Don't live with what the worship experience you had yesterday. Consistently, every day, stay on guard because if you're with God, you'll be fine. But you got to be on guard. And that has, here in this situation, has everything to do also with the way we think. We have to be on guard to catch the different ways that the devil tries to influence the way we think. I want to give you a couple more and we're going to finish up. Number two, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. In many ways, this is kind of the same thing because he uses the word alert. He uses the word to be on guard, right? To be alert. But here, the question isn't just, oh, be on guard, like look out for things. Like wake up today and understand that, hey, I got to be careful that the devil doesn't hit me with these attacks. I got to make sure to be able to catch the thoughts that look like they're okay, but they're not. And stop them before they land in my heart and I start dwelling on them. By the way, that's actually very important probably to clarify. What does it mean to receive a thought and to accept a thought? Allowing a thought to dwell in your heart. You understand you can't control whether a thought comes or goes. You understand that, right? It's going to come. A doubt will come. That doesn't make you a sinner. It doesn't make you not, uh, usually that means that you're probably in a good place if you're doubting something. Do you understand? If, even if you're doubting God, that usually signifies that you're standing somewhere on faith, right? That's a good thing. But whenever you have a thought visit you, the key thing is you can't control if it comes, but you control what you do with it. What do you do with a thought? If you just want to think about it, look, I'm not telling you to ignore thoughts. It doesn't work. Just letting you know it doesn't work. If you have a, a doubt in your heart, for example, maybe you came from school this last semester and something that you heard was very convincing. It's not about ignoring that and going, oh, it's whatever, I don't care. No, it's, God is real and I don't care about the doubt. I'll be honest, it'll catch up to you sooner or later. That's not the point. The key is to deal with it in the right way. You know how you deal with it? You go, okay, so this is what this message is. This is what it proposes. Now let me compare it to what God says. Let me measure it up to God's word and let's see where it stands. In fact, that's the easiest way to spot something that looks like light, but it's not. Because God's word is a mirror. It will always expose the truth. We read that in James, right? In James, it says that the word of God is like a mirror. It's like a person who walks up to a mirror and they, when they look into it, they see things as they are. You see that you have a smudge. Or you see that, hey, actually this part right here is pretty clean. It exposes that. And so when you take that, you will submit. How do you submit it? It says that we submit our thoughts. We take them captive and we submit them. 
to Christ. How do you take it captive? You're alert. You measure it up to the Word of God. So, for example, when there's a thought about you that you're not good enough or you're messed up looking or, or you're not capable of something or you're going to fail, you take those things and you go, hold on, what does God think about me? It's practical. I'm sorry. There's no secret menu that you have to figure out or secret combo. It doesn't work that way. It's actually very easy, accessible to anybody, even if you don't know how to read. All you do is you measure it up to God's word and say, God, well, what do you think? Hold on. You died for me? Wait, you wove me in my mother's womb? You made me unique? You gave me gifts that I possess from you? You have a purpose for me? I'm an eternal being? And you start lining it up. And what are you doing with that? You're submitting that thought to Christ. And you're, you're dealing with it. You're not running away from it. You're dealing with it. You're beating it. You're destroying it. Does that sound like a lot of work? What did you think Christianity was? It's not just that it's a lot of work. It's actually amazing to experience when you can be victorious. Do you know how amazing it is when you experience victory? When you see these things falling apart and you're dealing with them and you see it for real. It's not just reading or hearing stories from your grandparents. You like see it with your own eyes. That's what God has for you and, my, and me. I have one more thing. I will give you some verses to take home with you. I want you guys to read this for yourself, to take this message and read it for yourself. And it's all in one location. But the one point that I want to share here is this. You have to learn to look up. You have to learn to look up. You can read, even go online. You can Google this. By the way, it's not cheating, just so you know. You can Google verses about keeping my eyes on Christ. Just go down the verses. It's not cheating. It's okay. And by the way, those of you who don't understand King James Version, you don't have to read the King James Version. It's okay. Just whatever gets you the word of God, just do it, okay? And on your phone is also all right. Just read it. Google it for yourself. How to keep my eyes on Christ. In Romans 8, 8, it says, Those who live according to the flesh, listen, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. They live by the flesh. Their mind is a slave to their flesh and it just keeps feeding itself and that's how people spiral out of control but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires the mind governed by the flesh is death but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace so when i say that it's a lot of work don't compare it to your job at, you know, Wendy's or wherever, <laughs> or construction or doctor or whatever it is, or nurse that you're working hard. Don't compare it to that. What happens when you give your heart and your mind to the Spirit? You have a life in peace. How do you give your mind to the Spirit? How do you give yourself to the Spirit? By dwelling on it. By seeking the things the Spirit desires. That's what it says here. They have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. That's what we call learning to know God. Spending time with Him. Learning who He is. What He loves. How do you view this situation? How do you view that? It's done in, 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 by reading Scripture. By praying. By talking to other believers. That's one of the most underutilized tools we have talking to each other about Christ. Do you know how much that feeds us and builds us up? It takes you and it makes you focus on the Spirit. You build each other up. That's what Scripture promises and tells us to build each other up in that way. But it's also done in practice as well. When you are dealing with a decision and you're like, God, what would you do in this situation? God, I, I, so, I have, you know, sometimes in business people face that where if they just cut a corner, I mean, they won't really hurt anybody, but if they cut a corner, they'll make more money. And you know, it's for my wife and kids. <laughs> and they're before this simple decision, it's like a small, tiny little thing of ethics. In that moment when you go, God, but 
well, what is your way? What do you want to do? And God shows you and you follow that. Guess what? Not only did you learn what the Spirit desires, you lived it just now. You submitted your mind, every part of you, to the Spirit's desire. Do you understand how practical this is? How easy it is? It's easy. Anybody could do it. Even a child could do it. Jesus always invited the children. If children could do it, you could do it. When you go home, look up the armor of God. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up, actually. Look up the armor of God. We're talking about battle here. We're talking about war here. We've talked about where the battleground is. But I want you to go home and look up the armor of God and study it. You know, you can just pray and say, God, teach me what this is. When you wear this armor, you are alert and ready to fight. You can't fight if you don't have the gear on you, right? If you're not in the battlefield and you're at the wrong place, you can't fight. Obviously, you lost already. But you can't fight if you don't have anything to fight with. Study the tools that God has given you if you want to be victorious. The promise that God has is that he says that in the end, our minds will be governed by the Spirit. You know what that means? Governed by the Spirit. It means that there's a master and he rules over it. He reigns over that. When you have a governor of a state, the boundaries of that state, he governs. He's in charge of it. He directs it. He guides it. He deals with everything that happens there, the money, all of that stuff. Imagine if the spirit is a governor of your mind. God says that can be. No matter what you face, no matter what failures, no matter what criticism, no matter what, you're safe. You're just like, it doesn't phase you. Even death doesn't phase you. That's what it means to be governed by the Spirit. I want to pray with you guys, and I want to right away say this. You know, a lot of times in church, we think that this last prayer after a sermon, that it's like an ultimate special prayer. Friends, it's just a prayer. <laughs> it's just a prayer. Don't put anything on me. Don't put anything on, on even just the leaders here. God has been talking to you. You need to talk to Him. You need to do it right now. You need to do it at home. This prayer doesn't just solidify it for, you know, three days and there's an expiration date and after three days. No, this prayer is for today, for right now. Tomorrow's another prayer. I want to challenge you, though. If God spoke to you today, if you see that your mind is somewhat out of control, you can't control your flesh, you can't control all that, I want you to pray about it and I want you to understand that. It doesn't have to be that way. You can have victory. All right?